Aristotle Onassis was one of the richest playboys of the 20th century. He was hideous physically, but he had enormous magnetic charm. Charismatic but Machiavellian, like Midas, everything he touched turned to gold. The deadly sins of Aristotle Onassis were greed and deceit. The most beautiful and influential women of the age fell under his spell and into his arms. The profile of my wallet, he once told me, is a better profile than Clark Gable's. He caused a scandal when he married Jackie Kennedy, the widow of President John F. Kennedy. Jackie clearly married Ari for money. And Ari married Jackie so that he could stick his fingers up to America. But the man with a Midas touch never found true happiness. The empire he spent his whole life building in the end destroyed him and his family. This was a Greek tragedy, a real Greek tragedy. When Jackie Kennedy, widow of the assassinated American president John F. Kennedy, married a short and stocky man 30 years her senior, the world was scandalized. America reacted very badly to Jackie's wedding to Onassis. People talked about her marrying a toad. But the man who took America's queen for his wife was no ordinary man. He was Aristotle Onassis. He was the playboy of the Western world. He had enormous success. He was enormously rich. Throughout his life, Aristotle Onassis was utterly single-minded in his pursuit of money. He knew exactly what he wanted in life. He had no time for debate or argument. From a very early age, he learned how to use anything and anybody to achieve his goals. Ari felt that everyone had a price and could be bought, but like most cynics, he wanted to be proven wrong. Aristotle had houses in all the world's most glamorous cities. A luxury yacht, a private island, his own airline, a fleet of the biggest oil tankers on Earth, and a bank balance worth billions in today's money. But Aristotle wasn't born into great wealth. As a refugee from war-torn Turkey, he arrived in Argentina in 1923 with just $60 to his name. What he lacked in ready money, he made up for in charm and cunning. He knew how to use people, especially women, to get what he wanted. Joan Thring met Aristotle in the 1960s and became one of his lovers. He was very charming and polite and attentive. But basically, I don't think he had enormous respect for women. He didn't worship at their feet. He treated them as stepping stones for his own ambitions. I don't think he ever fell in love with a woman that wasn't driven by a purpose, and it was usually a commercial purpose. Ari's first wife was Tina Lavanos, the daughter of a Greek shipping magnate. Ari always felt that the amalgam of the Lavanos fortune and the Onassis fortune would make him legendary. He was becoming legendary anyway, but he was in a hurry. They had two children, Alexandra in 1948 and Christina in 1950. But Ari and Tina clearly preferred the high life to family life. They were basically absentee parents. They didn't have much time to put in with the children. They were really raised by governesses and people who worked for Ari. The victims of that relationship were the kids. The kids were tremendously spoiled, but they weren't loved. Aristotle's appetite for money and power was matched only by his appetite for women. Ari Onassis was a powerful, magnetic figure with a great deal of charisma. He was also a, a terrific philanderer as far as women were concerned. Aristotle's personal private secretary for over nine years was Kiki Ferudi Mutsatsos. Ari was uh, not handsome, not handsome at all, but every woman who was next to him thought that he was the most handsome in the world. Harry had such charm, such seductive powers. I don't know a single woman that resisted Aristotle and Asses if he had set his heart on her. His affair with a world-renowned opera star, Maria Callas, would cause his marriage to end. He was so proud of this relationship, 
he flaunted it. He wanted the world to know that he had acquired, just as he had acquired great paintings, he had acquired the most famous opera singer in the world. And she was like a Picasso or a Rembrandt. That's what he saw her as. And what's the point of having a Picasso or a Rembrandt if you're not going to let the world know you've got it? The affair hit the headlines around the world. In Maria, many people thought Ari had found his true soulmate. Ari always said he could talk with Maria more freely than with any woman uh, in his life. They were sort of kindred spirits. But he never married his soulmate. Instead, he broke a heart when in 1968, he married Jackie Kennedy. Maria was destroyed by it. I think it was a terrible thing to have done to her. But Ari was completely ruthless in his quest for power and status. He wanted Jackie Kennedy because she was the most famous woman in the world. He would say, the 35th president of the United States, his widow will be my wife one day. That meant a lot to him. The marriage to America's queen, however, would prove a terrible mistake. Ari got bored with all his women in the end, and he started to get bored and irritated by Jackie. He wanted a good little Greek wife sitting there at home. Well, that was not Jackie's bag at all. And this became increasingly destructive of their relationship. This was the beginning of the end for Anassis. Within five years, his marriage would be over, and his son and heir would be tragically killed in a plane crash. The weapon that destroyed the dynasty was the weapon that Anassis had fought all his life to fashion. It's the weapon of wealth. It's the weapon of too much money. This story is a true-life Greek tragedy. Smyrna in Turkey at the end of the 19th century was one of the busiest ports in Europe. It buzzed with commercial activity. Against this backdrop, Aristotle Anassas was born in 1904, the younger of two children born to affluent Greek parents, Socrates and Penelope Anassas. Harry was an enormously well-loved child, uh, especially by the women in the family. His father was another situation altogether. Socrates was a successful tobacco merchant. He wanted his son to join him in the family business. His father was very ambitious for him. It was his father that drove him through school, uh, insisted on him studying. But Aristotle preferred to spend his time swimming in the harbour with his mate. He hated school, and his marks were among the lowest in the class. Anassis's father was, I think, a bit of a bully and uh, had lost faith in his son very early on. Aristotle's life was turned upside down in 1921 when the Turks attacked Greek-occupied Smyrna. The invasion of Smyrna, of course, was devastating. The Turks moved in and wiped out the Greek community. It was a holocaust. Thousands of men and women were killed. Ari's father Socrates was caught and thrown into prison. Ari himself escaped imprisonment by seducing a Turkish officer. I don't believe that Anassis was by nature a homosexual, but he would use anything to get what he wanted. Ari bribed the guards with his family's life savings to release his father. His father was released, came to Athens where he said, where's the money? And Anassis said, but I used it to bribe uh, Turkish officials to release you. He said, they were going to release me anyway, and he slapped him. Aristotle was overcome with rage. He resolved to leave his father and quit Greece and strike out on his own. He chose Argentina. Buenos Aires was a vibrant and bustling city, full of opportunity for an immigrant with big ideas. Ari arrived in 1923 with just $60 in his pocket. He got a job as a telephone engineer. It didn't pay well, but Aristotle turned it into a golden opportunity. He would listen in on all the business calls going between Buenos Aires and London, Buenos Aires and New York, and would get a lot of tips from the businesses that were being discussed on the telephone. Ari used the information to set up contracts of his own. He soon began to make money. But whatever it was he made, every penny went into his wardrobe, into good shoes, into good suits, into good shirts. Ari
Jerry had reinvented himself as an influential and successful businessman. He began to mix with the cream of Buenos Aires society. No one knew quite where he came from. They had no idea that when he left there, this man who appeared to have enormous sort of wealth would go and change his clothes, go to the telephone exchange and become a telephonist. In the mid-1920s, Ari listened into a phone call that would change his life. A new film starring Rudolf Valentino had made it fashionable among women in the United States to smoke. Ari decided to produce his own brand of cigarettes, aimed exclusively at women in Argentina. To market his product, he turned to Claudia Muzio, an internationally famous soprano who was performing at the Opera House in Buenos Aires. He decided that it would be wonderful if Claudia could be persuaded to smoke his brand of cigarette in public. He went round one evening to the stage door with a huge bunch of flowers, huge, dwarfed him. And behind the bunch of flowers was his little face and she eventually agreed to see him. And he literally seduced her. Claudia became Ari's lover and smoked his cigarettes in public. Sales went through the roof. Ari realized that his power to charm and seduce could serve his ambitions well. It was a technique he would perfect into an art form over the years. He had enormous magnetic charm. If she set out to capture somebody, socially, sexually, or whatever, he would do so. The tobacco business made Ari a millionaire. Once Claudia Muzio had served her purpose, Aristotle dropped her cold. She became the first victim of his ambition, but there were to be many more. With the money rolling in, Aristotle could have retired comfortably, but he was not so easily satisfied, and he spotted a business opportunity with even bigger potential than the cigarettes. Aristotle Narcissus noticed that the cost for bringing the tobacco from Greece was greater than what he made selling the tobacco. So he said the business to be in is shipping. But in 1932, the world was in the grip of the Great Depression. Profit margins were tight. Shipping companies went bankrupt on a daily basis. As everybody was getting out, Ari got in. He bought six ships for less than half their scrap value. He worked like a dog, 18, 20 hours, uh, finding cargoes for them, and then started making money. For five years, Ari concentrated doggedly on keeping his ships working. Against all the odds, he was successful. To maximize his profits, he needed larger vessels, but he had no line of credit. A new girlfriend, Ingeborg Dedikan, came to the rescue. Not merely beautiful, Ingeborg was the daughter of one of the world's wealthiest shipping magnates. Onassis never had a single object in mind when he pursued a woman. She always had to have something else going for her beyond her beauty. And that something always had some connection with business. They were based in London. From here, Harry used Ingeborg's contacts to finance the construction of three of the biggest supertankers on Earth. He found a shipyard in Sweden capable of building his new fleet. In late 1938, the first vessel was ready for business. Harry was contracted to transport oil from America to Japan. The deal would make him fabulously rich. But before the tanker left harbor, Disaster struck. War broke out across Europe. Sweden was anxious to remain neutral and promptly seized all foreign ships in its ports, including Ari's tankers. He lost a fortune and his debts began to spiral out of control. Aristotle and Asa's dream of becoming a shipping tycoon was unraveling before his eyes. In 1940, Hitler's armies rampaged across Europe. In fear of his life, Aristotle Anassas fled to America, leaving his girlfriend Ingeborg Dedekan in Europe. Safe in New York, Ari set about trying to reverse his fortunes. 
In a highly lucrative deal, he leased his six cargo ships to the Allied war effort. Then he sat back and began to enjoy the high life. In New York, he found a whole new world. He found a much more exciting world. Until that moment, he was totally dedicated to making his fortune. He had all this money coming in, paid for by the American government, and he started having affairs with beautiful women. He became a playboy, dating a whole string of famous women, including Greta Garbo. By the end of the war, Aristotle had made millions. His three super tankers had been released from the Swedish port, and shipping prices were sky high. With his financial empire guaranteed, Ari looked to the future. He wanted an heir to inherit the Onassis name, so he needed to find a wife. Aristotle met a beautiful young woman called Tina Lavanos. When he looked into her eyes, he saw more than love. He saw ships. The essential attraction in Tina Lavanos was Daddy's tankers. Tina's father was Stavros Levanos, the world's richest shipping magnate. Tina was unsure about Aristotle at first, but he soon won her over. They were married on the 28th of December 1946 in New York. He was 42. She was 17. The marriage between Anassis and uh, Tina Levanos at the beginning was very successful. She wanted to be a society hostess. He bought her a beautiful townhouse in Manhattan where she became the youngest, the prettiest hostess around. They were entertaining all the local celebrities of that, of that time, and it's all she ever wanted. And I think had Onassis been satisfied with that life, it could have gone on forever. But he was never satisfied. Aristotle was at the top of his game. He spent every waking moment at work, earning more and more money. No one knew the tanker business better than Onassis. He would make the decisions. He would calculate as cunningly and as carefully as any mathematician. His obsession with work kept him more and more remote from Tina. Even the arrival of their children, Alexandra in 1948 and Christina in 1950, did not induce Ari to spend any time at home. He was never the most devoted or loyal husband and he was having affairs a lot by this time. Unfortunately, he married a woman much younger, a woman who had been educated abroad, and uh, when she found out what he was up to, she paid him back in kind. Ari and Tina eventually agreed to an open marriage on the condition that they both kept quiet about their affairs. But Ari could never be discreet. In 1957, he met Maria Callas, one of the most celebrated opera singers of all time. Ari was attracted to Maria for several reasons. She was famous, he liked famous women. She was passionate and emotional, and it was important for him to win her and to seduce her, basically. Maria was married to her business manager, Battista Meningini, but Aristotle didn't let that get in the way. The seduction began at a ball in Venice held in Maria's honor. Yeah, Maria was uh, quite a bit taller than Onassis, and she tried to crouch when they were dancing. And he said to her, you don't have to crouch. Most women I dance with are taller than I am. And she said, you don't mind that? He said, no, for most women, I'm much taller because they think of me standing on my money. <laughs> so, so she liked his humor, and uh, he immediately invited her on his yacht. Ari's private yacht, the Christina, named after his daughter, was the most luxurious in the world. Despite the presence of her husband, Batista, Maria and Ari began a clandestine affair during the cruise. But it just wasn't in Ari's nature to keep the affair a secret. Ari was so proud of this relationship, he flaunted it. He wanted the world to know that he had acquired, just as he had acquired great paintings, he had acquired the best opera singer in the world. Publicly humiliated, Tina sued for divorce. Harry did not want to divorce Tina. He wanted to just have an affair with Maria and keep the, the marriage intact. But Tina 
was turned off, not because of the relationship, but because it was making the front pages. The affair also ended Maria's marriage, but that was a sacrifice she was happily prepared to make. Maria Callas was the strongest love for Ari, and Ari was the strongest love for Maria Callas. In Paris, they used to shut themselves up in this small apartment and make spaghetti, throw plates at each other, and generally scream. The tempestuous passion of the affair endeared Aristotle to Maria's cultured circle of friends, but on occasion, he could be very cruel to her. Ari was an absolute expert at undermining people's confidence. And because of this streak of cruelty in him, he did it to poor Maria Callas. He virtually destroyed her career. He'd tell her that her voice sounded like a whistle. He was also taking other lovers, including Joan Thring, Rudolf Nureyev's personal assistant. She spent two weeks alone with Ari on board the Christina. One day we sat sunbathing and having lunch at the back of the boat and um, playing these records that Maria had given him. And when we didn't like it, we gave it a thumbs down and just tossed it overboard and watched it bounce away. And uh, a few of them went that way, actually. <laughs> In 1959, Maria became pregnant. Harry demanded that she have an abortion, but Maria refused. On the 30th of March, 1960, Maria gave birth to a son, Omero, in secret, in a private clinic in Milan. Just after the birth, Omero developed breathing difficulties. The clinic was poorly equipped and couldn't save him. He died a few hours later. All that remains is this blurred photograph of their son, taken by Maria to show to Ari, who predictably was not with her at the birth. But more heartbreak was imminent. Maria was destroyed, and the world shocked when Aristotle Onassis pulled off the dynastic coup of the century and married the Queen of America, Jackie Kennedy. By the 1960s, Aristotle Onassis had become a multi-billionaire. His shipping empire was one of the biggest in the world. He was having a much publicized romance with the prima donna Maria Callas. Behind her back, he was also having an affair with one of their new friends, Lee Radzivill. She was unhappily married to Prince Stanislav Radzivill and saw Ari as her escape route. Ari saw in Lee a very important family connection. Her sister was Jackie Kennedy, wife of the US president, John F. Kennedy. In 1963, Jackie had lost a baby boy, Patrick, just hours after his birth. Onassis says, in a great moment of expansion, invite Jackie aboard the, the Christina to, to recuperate. She can have my yacht. She can go wherever she wants. Lee Radzivill, very foolishly in my opinion, extended that invitation to her sister, who grabbed at it. Jackie and Ari became close friends during the cruise. It was to that friendship that Jackie turned just one month later after the tragic events of the 22nd of November, 1963. A dark page in the annals of America has been written to the crack of an assassin's bullet. A nation mourns, the world grieves. The man who became 35th president less than three years ago is dead. The assassination of John F. Kennedy was a monumental tragedy. America was devastated. Never before had there been such a massive outpouring of grief for JFK and for the young family he'd left behind. Lee immediately made her way to the White House to comfort Jackie, and she brought Ari along. So Ari was actually in the White House during those days when the whole world watched the Kennedy funeral, and he was there to comfort both of them. The pictures of Jackie at the funeral made her into an icon of grieving womanhood and were imprinted on 20th century history. America saw Jackie as America's queen. And I think that the one moment that struck everybody is at Jack's funeral. That's the moment that her image captured the essence of being regal. In the agony of the following months, 
Jackie clung to Ari, but he wanted more than a friendship. Maria Callas was quite confident that nothing would come of his relationship with Jackie Kennedy. It was a step too far. The Holy Widow was beyond even Onassis's charm, even beyond the reach of his money. She could not accept it would happen. But Onassis was to prove her wrong. In time, Jackie Kennedy did become Aristotle's lover. The affair was conducted in the utmost secrecy. Well, Jackie and Ari kept their relationship secret for various reasons. Number one, the American public would not be keen about it. Number two, a presidential election was taking place that year, and Bobby Kennedy was running. He regarded Ari as a pirate, and uh, so he jokingly said to Jackie, uh, if this gets out before these primary elections are over, it might cost me five states. So Jackie promised him, she said, not only will I keep this secret, but I'm going to agree to come out of retirement and campaign for you. She left the yacht in order to go to Bobby Kennedy's last primary. And as she left, she said to me, I just hope he doesn't win, because uh, if he does, somebody will kill him. Five days later, on the 5th of June, 1968, Jackie's dark forebodings became reality. Bobby Kennedy was shot and killed at the Ambassador's Hotel in Los Angeles. After Bobby was assassinated, she was really quite scared for herself and her children. She said, who's the next Kennedy they're going to come after? It's going to be me and my children. So she felt that she wanted to leave the United States. She didn't want to live here anymore. America had become too claustrophobic for Jackie where the entire nation was obsessed by the fate of the Kennedy family. Going out in New York with Jackie was really scary. We went to the theater together, and all of a sudden there was thunderous noise coming down both aisles. Somebody had seen her, and the whole of the audience came back, and they filed up and down in front of us, just staring at her. It was the most macabre experience. Jackie turned to Aristotle for help. So he was on Assis, who had this private island, who had all these uh, guards around him all the time. So he provided a refuge for her. In addition to guaranteeing her personal safety, Aristotle also offered financial security. The relationship between Onassis and Jackie was, whether we like it or not, a relationship built on money. Jackie wanted the security and the finances that Onassis could provide. It certainly has been said that Jackie was greedy for money. She certainly wanted it to spend on clothes. She wanted that security. She was tremendously afraid of being poor. Their relationship was still a closely guarded secret, but that was about to change. Jackie called Onassis and told him that the Boston Herald was going to run a story about their affair. And this would be a tragedy for, for her children. They had to get married right away. Ari hadn't planned to marry again, but having Jackie Kennedy as a wife presented certain advantages. The answer to why Anassis married Jackie is simple and not very creditable. He wanted the ultimate trophy wife. Jackie Kennedy was perhaps the most famous and desirable woman in the world at one time. But it wasn't the fact that she was beautiful or desirable. It was what she had to offer, and what she had to offer were the keys to the Washington establishment. Jackie always insisted that it wasn't just a business arrangement, even though there were financial and prestige elements to be gained by both of them. She always insisted it was a love match, and Ari did for a while. Jackie Kennedy became Jackie O in October 1968. They tied the knot on Aristotle's private island of Scorpios. America reacted very badly to her wedding to Nassus. People talked about her marrying a toad, about her stepping down from her pedestal. I mean, they were all shocked. And one foreign newspaper's headline was, Jackie, how could you? She was America's queen and uh, her image was such that it just didn't fit 
with this little guy who looked like a turtle and who had the reputation of being a pirate. Aristotle's children, Alexander and Christina, were very hostile to his new union. The children never liked Jackie. They thought that one day their father could be again with their mother. That was their dream. And they thought every woman who was next to their father, uh, they thought that uh, she was a stealer. But Aristotle ignored everybody's feelings, including Maria's. She was heartbroken by the marriage. Maria Callas once said to me after Onassis had married Jackie, maybe if I'd fought a little harder and been a little braver, I could have kept him, but I couldn't believe that he, he would ever pull that one off. At that moment, it seemed Aristotle could do no wrong. Like King Midas, everything he touched turned to gold. But a fateful series of events would soon conspire to bring Anassus to his knees and his dynasty crashing to the ground. Aristotle Anassus was a self-made man. His determination to create a fantastically rich financial empire had been realized. But it was his children who would pay the price for his overblown ambitions. The kids were tremendously spoiled, but they weren't loved. Not in the sense that the parent should love a child. Alexander and Christina were brought up by a succession of nannies and security guards. It was Alexander who said to me, you know, I had a very privileged childhood, I was very spoiled. But I knew my parents through postcards. I was getting postcards from them. I wasn't getting hugs. Gary was rather a brutal father in many ways. I don't think he did an awful lot for their self-confidence, and that's particularly the case with Christina Anassis, uh, who was terrified of him. She went silent. She had actually thought she was autistic at one point because she refused to speak. But Alexander, Aristotle's only son and heir, was the complete opposite. He was obnoxiously bratty. Alexander would seek attention by recklessness, by driving toy cars into Ari's guests. And uh, when there was attention, it was highly critical. It wasn't until Alexander became a young adult and of use to his father's business empire that Aristotle took any interest in him at all. He wanted to reinvent himself as, as a loving father, but of course, by that time it was too late. There was a clash, and Alexander resisted it. But resistance was useless. Aristotle held all the cards. Onassis, very early in young Alexander's life indeed, denied him an education. At the age of 15, he took him out of school. He was therefore stuck with his dad. He had nowhere to go. Ari insisted that he work for the Olympic maritime shipping business in Monaco and sit in the same room with Ari. But he said, I'm only paying you an allowance because you're my son, but you're not worthy of a salary. And he took every opportunity to put down Alexander in front of others. Alexander resented the control his father exercised over him. Discontent turned to anger when Aristotle began to interfere in his private life. At 18, Alexander had started a relationship with Fiona Thiessen, a beautiful model, 16 years his senior. Alex was infatuated with Fiona at first sight. He was able to talk to Fiona and get guidance from her in a way that he could not get from any of the girlfriends that he'd picked up in his life. So uh, she was everything to him. Nassis was furious, absolutely furious. And for one reason only, Onassis believed that Fiona should have fallen in love with him and not his son. And it was the first time in his relationship with his son that his son had something that Onassis knew he couldn't have, and that was this mistress. He told his son that uh, he wanted him to stop seeing Fiona, and his son said, forget it, you know, I'll stop seeing you first, Dad. For the first time in his life, Alexander disobeyed Aristotle. Desperately unhappy in his job in shipping, he was put in charge of his father's air taxi service, as he was a qualified and accomplished pilot. Alexander was good at the new job, but he yearned to quit his father's business forever. Secretly, he'd been planning his escape. 
He was going to go back to university, he was going to get an education, and he was going to embark on whatever career he wanted, but on his own. Alex had one last job to do for Olympic and for Ari, and that was to check out a new pilot for his father's private airplane. On the 22nd of January, 1973, the airplane took off from Athens. Within seconds of becoming airborne, the right wing dropped sharply and the plane crashed to the ground. The plane landed on its right side and Alexander's skull was crushed. He was rushed to hospital where with massive head wounds he slipped into a coma. Harry was in New York when he got the news and he got a hold of a neurosurgeon in Boston and one from Texas and one from London and flew them all into Athens uh, to join the effort to save uh, Alexander's life. Aristotle's private secretary, Kiki, was at the hospital. He asked the doctor, doctor, please tell me, is my child, is my child going to die? Or is my child going to be alive? I could give all my property, all my money, everything I have in my life. But Alexander's condition was hopeless. The brain damage was irreversible and irreparable, and the only choice was to allow him to die. Ari gave the instruction to turn off Alexander's life support machine. He was gutted. He didn't want to live. He didn't care whether he lived or died because he was so grief-stricken. However badly he had treated Alexander, he was the future. He was the boy that was going to carry on the Onassis name, and the Onassis name meant so much to Onassis. So all his plans, all his dreams had died with him. He was starting to lose his mind. He couldn't believe that Alexandros had gone. When Alexander was killed, it really was the beginning of the end for Onassis. Ari's empire started to fall apart as tragedy followed tragedy. On the 10th of October, 1974, Aristotle's first wife, Tina, the mother of his children, was found dead at home. She was only 43. To this day, the cause of death is still cloaked in mystery. Aristotle's second marriage to Jackie Kennedy was also in crisis. Onassis realized that Jackie was not going to be the kind of wife that he wanted. He wanted Jackie because he thought she would open doors for him in Washington, that Jackie made it clear that she would never play that role. As newlyweds, Ari and Jackie had projected the image of a happy couple, two people very content with each other. But this was far from the truth. Having married Jackie, Ari went back to Maria a week later in Paris. It uh, astonished uh, Jackie with the uh, rapidity of, of Onassis is showing his colors. And she realized, of course, that uh, uh, Onassis was no different from Jack Kennedy. Maria was far more than a mistress to Ari. If Onassis loved anyone in his life, it was Maria Callas. There was a, a deep, undying love on Maria's part for Onassis. Jackie had a deep, respect for Onassis's money. Ari and Jackie had become estranged. Jackie was spending nearly all her time in New York with her children. It's alleged that Ari even consulted a divorce lawyer. But then in 1974, Aristotle collapsed. He desperately needed gallbladder surgery. His best chance of survival would have been an operation in America, but Aristotle refused that. He thought about it for a minute and said, I want to go to Paris. But the, the reason he wanted to go to Paris, he wanted to see Maria one last time. The surgery resulted in a serious infection from which he never recovered. Maria stole into Ari's room when Jackie was away. It was the last time she saw him alive. On Saturday, the 15th of March, 1975, Aristotle Socrates Onassis died. He was 71 years old. Maria Callas never recovered from his death. She locked herself away from the world and struggled hopelessly against an addiction to sleeping pills. 
on the 16th of September, 1977. She also died. She was 53. All the women who were involved with Ali seem to have had rather tragic lives and particularly tragic deaths. In fact, the only one who escaped unscathed was Jackie. Jackie returned to New York to live and started a new career in publishing. In Athens, the Anassas Empire was rocked to its foundations by the death of its founder. As his only surviving heir, it fell to Aristotle's daughter, Christina, to take control of the family business. Christina did her best to run the business, but she was a mess by this time. She tried to commit suicide at least a couple of times. She herself was in no condition to take over such a complex, vast organization. Christina had personally inherited over $250 million, but the money was not destined to bring her happiness. The tragedies that had cursed her father's later life were to be her legacy also. However hard she tried, she was never going to spend that money. And she tried very hard. I mean, she was buying lovers and putting them into beautiful houses that she would visit. And she made no secret of that. She didn't see anything wrong. Christina married four times, but each marriage ended in divorce. It looked as if she would take the Anassas name to the grave. But then in 1985, ten years after Aristotle's death, Christina gave birth to a baby girl. She called her Athena after her own mother. But she would never live to see her daughter grow to womanhood. Christina died in 1988. Christina was a doomed woman. She died age 37 in mysterious circumstances, in the bath, in Buenos Aires, where her father's fortune was first begun. Athena Anassas Roussel went to live with her father, Thierry Roussel. When she turned 18 in 2003, she inherited in excess of $400 million, making her the richest girl in the world. The rest of the Anassas fortune, now worth over a billion dollars, is controlled by a trust based in Athens, which manages the remains of Aristotle's business empire. In 1994, Jackie Anassas died at the age of 64. She was buried beside JFK in Arlington National Cemetery under the name Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Anassas. Aristotle Anassas never did create the mighty dynasty that he dreamed of. But the stories of the man who built a vast financial empire from nothing and seduced some of the most beautiful and celebrated women in the world will reverberate through the ages.